Okay, I think uh, there might be a couple of folks joining us, but we'll get started and uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, before we do, I'm wondering how many developers do we have in the room? All right, a few of you. Um, you'll probably pick up a thing or two, but we're sort of tailoring this mostly towards the project managers, designers, and webmasters of the, of the audience a little bit more. Um, I'm also wondering if anybody went to uh, Jill's session about Princeton migrations earlier. Okay, a couple people. Um, we, we were there, it was really, really interesting. Uh, a little bit different though, we're talking about migrating uh, like single sort of large sites, whereas that was more about the, you know, migrating Princeton's massive uh, amount of, of, of shared sites, or of, of, of sites there. Um, so, but what are we talking about? We're talking about, about content migrations. Uh, what non-developers specifically should know about content migrations? Um, so first of all, round of introductions. Uh, my name is Jesse. I am a solutions architect uh, with Evolving Web. Uh, I've been there for about two, so over two, two and a half years, I think. Um, I have about 10 years of experience doing full stack web development on various open source platforms, including Drupal. Uh, I don't do too much development these days. I'm more at a planning and, and discovery uh, phases earlier on in, in the project life cycle and, and supporting developers as I, as I can later. Hi everyone, my name is Maya. I joined uh, Evolve Web last summer as a Drupal developer, full stack Drupal developer. I've been doing Drupal since 2020, and during the migration process, I'm the one doing the actual migration, the actual work with Drupal. And uh, who is Evolving Web? Um, well, we're a, a full service uh, digital agency. We're based in Montreal in Canada. Um, we work with a lot of big organizations like uh, higher education institutions, uh, healthcare, uh, and various other smaller agencies as well. Um, but places that want to make that, that big impact in the world. Uh, so we've been with Drupal for about 15, 16 years. I'd say we're about 85 or 90 people now spread out quite around the world. Uh, we're, we're headquartered in Montreal. A few of us are from Montreal, but we're, we're a pretty, pretty global company at the end of the day. Uh, so here's just a couple of our clients that we've, that we've worked with uh, on, on some migration projects specifically, uh, including uh, Princeton, we'll talk about uh, SBA in a moment, uh, the Royal Ontario Museum we're working on, uh, Prince Edward Island, uh, uh, their new website for the, the province of Prince Edward Island, and uh, the National Health Institute for, uh, in Quebec. Uh, so I mentioned uh, the, uh, the Princeton uh, School of Public and International Affairs, or SPIA. Uh, we worked with them a couple of years ago on doing their uh, seven to ten, uh, sorry, nine at that time, uh, mi migration, and, and did some work to sort of bring in the whole site into the, the rest of the, of the Princeton brand. We also worked with uh, Bonjour Quebec, sort of the, the, the travel uh, tourism agency in, in the province of Quebec. Uh, and that was a, a really big migration. We had about 10,000 uh, pages, sorry, 100,000 pages. Uh, to, uh, to move over onto, onto Drupal from, uh, from another platform. Um, a lot of work, a really nice map on that site. It's a really great site, so if anyone's looking to come to Quebec, I highly recommend checking out that website. So we do a lot of content migrations. So that's why we're here to talk about content migrations today. Uh, we think we have a lot to share about that and a lot of, of, of things that we've learned about uh, how to do that work. But as I mentioned, I'm not really a Drupal developer anymore. I'm not really doing much development on these projects. I'm involved a lot more at a sort of more higher level, doing planning, doing um, helping out the, the, the developers as they go, um, doing a lot of the discovery work. Um, so our goal here is, is basically to tell you what we've learned in all that process and, and figure out how we can maybe help you if you are going to be involved in a website migration in the future, whether that be a Drupal 7 to 10, or maybe it's another proprietary CMS into Drupal, or not even involving Drupal at all. These uh, recommendations, these tips and tricks will probably help you regardless. But before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, human migrations. Um, we've been migrating as a species for a real long time. Um, it probably doesn't look quite like this anymore, uh, but uh, you know, generally the ideas stay the same. Um, and I want to bring this up because uh, actually both of us have recently undergone our own migrations recently. Uh, I moved from uh, Central Canada to uh, join my team uh, in Montreal. Um, that was uh, across the continent, so it was actually quite easy for me to, for the most part, pick up everything I have, throw it in this truck, and drive about 2,500 kilometers over four days, uh, and just pack up and move. 
um, we didn't really do a lot of the, 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 the real good uh, purging and planning that we should have done. This was about six months of living like this. Um, not, not a whole lot of fun, but you know, we, we got it done in the end. Uh, it was a mess of organizing and selling and purging and just dealing with everything. But ultimately, we took way more stuff than we should have. And this is what our, our new apartment ended up looking like as we unloaded that, that U-Haul. Um, still lots of cleanup that needed to happen. Uh, I really wish we hadn't taken this much stuff with us. And around the same time as Jesse was moving from Central Canada to Montreal, I was moving from France to Canada. And of course, as I was changing continent, it was an entire different things. I had to get rid of most of my stuff because I had, I had to choose what to take with me and get rid of most of it, most of it sorry, because uh, it was incompatible anyway. And so it was a very different way of doing things than Jesse. And this is what my house looked like when I arrived near Montreal. So clean slate and no content in it. And in a way, my migration was easier than Jesse's because I had nothing with me. I just had to find new content to put in it. So my, my, my content would have to be brand new. So really, the way that we're thinking about it is there's kind of two different kinds of migrations here. There's one where you're sort of more like starting over with a nice, uh, pristine state, or there's the one where you're dealing with a huge mess of stuff after the fact and having to clean it up uh, after all the work that you've already done. Um, so we have these sort of, sort of two different things, but, but which one is right? What is the, the right way to go? And we kind of think that ultimately neither one is incorrect. Yeah. In fact, in most of our cases, most of our websites, we're going to probably do a little bit of both. Uh, and that's, that's fine. The important thing is that you take the time to consider your options, to do some planning, and, and just make sure that you're making the right choices for the right buckets of content. So how do you start? When you know that you're going to make this big move, what do you, what do, you do to, to keep going, or, or to get started, rather? Uh, whether you're moving thousands of kilometers or just hundreds of kilometers, uh, or you're going from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 or other CMSs are involved, uh, the planning is definitely going to be your most important phase. And that brings us to the first phase of our migration, which is the discovery phase. And it's the phase where you avoid future issues. Discovery is the act of detecting something new or something previously unrecognized as meaningful. That definition is from Wikipedia, and Jesse loves this definition for a good reason, because it's exactly what we're going to do, what you are going to do to migrate your content. It's by far the most important part of the migration. Don't forget this phase. If your migration is of any particular size, you want to, it's worth taking the time. And again, we saw this morning, maybe you saw the example of the Princeton University, which was migrating thousands of websites from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10. And I think Jill mentioned that they took like around 400 hours for the discovery phase, something like that. So their discovery and their migration would be as smooth as possible. So it's worth taking that time. Um, you might want to jump right into your migration because of course you know your website, you know your content, and you want, to, you want your migration to be done as quickly as possible. But it's not always a good idea. I mean, along the way you, you find cobwebs and some odd content that doesn't fit anywhere. And if developers have to deal with that during the migration or after the migration, it's going to take more time. So you need to take the time to do your discovery. I'm going to say that a lot, but you, you really need to, to take your time. And also, if you want to do some redesign of your website along the way, you might want to do it at this point because Doing it afterwards, when your content is already migrated, your old content is already migrated to your, to your new website, is going to be more difficult. So think of it this way. Measure twice, cut once. It's an ancient Drupal proverb. And it's exactly what you are going to do and what we are going to help you do. Document everything in discovery. Otherwise, it might as well not exist. This is very important during the discovery process. We are going to produce quite a few documents. And among them, this is ferrets and my personal nemesis, which are spreadsheets. And it might not be the most enjoyable thing to do, but again, it will be worth it in the end. And you will need it to tell developers how to, how to do their job after that. So you need to list what do you have on your website. You might have content types and taxonomies that are well-structured or not. 
you might have files, images, PDF files that you want to take along with you on your migrations. You might have users with different user, user accounts and user roles that you want to have on your new website. You might have blocks, you might have views, redirects, and even maybe redirects from a former migration, and you want to take those with you during your new migration so your SEO ranking stay up to date. And you might even want to bring on with you your old module that stay at the bottom of the, file, of, the, of the slide. If you're migrating from 247 to 2410, for example, and you have custom modules that you want to bring with you, you need to document everything about those modules, what they are doing, uh, what they are they supposed to do, the way they work, because a lot of things change between Drupal 7 and Drupal 10, and the more you document those modules, the easier it will get for developers to translate them into Drupal 10 custom modules. And it keeps going. Um, your job is to know what's missing. You're, you're probably the expert of one specific area of your website, whether it is content, uh, governance, design, and you need to involve everybody that is an expert on your website to document everything. Uh, you didn't see web forms on the previous slide, but may, you might have also web forms that you want to, to, to migrate with your website. And you, you are the only one, and people that know your website along with you, you are the only ones that can point out what's missing on this list. So you need to involve everybody. Communication is the key. Don't underestimate discovery. I'm going to say that again. The bigger, the bigger your website is, the less organized your data is, and the more chance we have to discover things even after the discovery phase. And that's why your discovery phase needs to be very thorough make sure you give it the right amount of time. It will, in the end, it will save you time, it will save you complication, and it will save you money. And maybe, what you had it, consider embarking on that redesign, or at least a, a refresh of your website. We've had projects at Evolving Web where clients just wanted to, let's say, go from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 with the exact same design. And more often than not, we consider that it's not a good idea. You need to, while you're at it, you, you're, you're doing all this discovery and you might have new ideas that pop up and you need to write that down and maybe consider your redesign and maybe also along the way fix some accessibility issues, some maintenance problems that you have ongoing for maybe several weeks, months, years. So when your, your Drupal 10, your new Drupal 10 website is up and running, you'll just get rid of all of that, and you've got a, a new website that is perfectly functioning. Then it's time for a big cleanup, Jason. Yes, we need to clean up that content, that big mess of, of boxes that I failed to clean up ahead of time. Um, so uh, a wise colleague of ours once said, you don't need to QA things that you don't migrate. And I think that's pretty apt. Uh, cleaning everything up ahead of time is just going to save you time in the long run. It seems, again, that it might be kind of sort of painful and take a lot of time, but it will save you time uh, later. So how do we go about doing that? We've got to figure out what we have and then what we want to do with it. Uh, what do we want to keep? What do we want to merge? Or what do we want to trash? Or even just maybe simply just rewrite and start over from scratch. Uh, and actually, I would say that, that deciding on what you don't want is probably just as important as what you do want. And that's going to start to include even things like uh, revisions on your content, uh, comments or moderation status, uh, old events and old blog posts, things like that. Um, but one thing I'll definitely caution is it might be tempting to say that you don't want to keep all that old news or old blog posts. But, but do reconsider that because... If you all of a sudden subtract a thousand pages from your site, that might have an SEO impact as well. A lot of content just got removed. Uh, so it's definitely worth uh, considering, reconsidering that and using some analytics data as well to help you figure out how popular some of that content is and if it really is uh, 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 irrelevant. Just because it's old, it might not necessarily be irrelevant. So now we know what we have. Uh, we know what we're doing with it. Um, we haven't really talked about the new site too much just yet. Uh, that's not really our focus. That could be a whole other, a whole other project, really. Um, 
But let's assume that you've already figured out your content model, you have a new site uh, uh, in, in progress, uh, you know what you're keeping, you know what you're going to be migrating. So now it's time to, to start mapping that, that content. Uh, and that's really sort of, you can see it as bringing order to maybe what was a chaotic old site. Uh, so this is our chance to add some structure to what might have been very unstructured previously. Uh, so when we're looking at that, we're thinking about things like maybe you have some groupings of unca uncategorized content that might make sense as a new content type. Uh, you probably have old content types, and that might just simply translate into new content types uh, on your new site. There might be some unstructured page content as well. Uh, that might end up uh, making sense to translate into some new custom fields. Similarly, you might have some hard-coded components on some of your pages that should actually turn into new reusable blocks. There's probably a lot of old uh, custom fields as well that should just end up getting ported into new custom fields in your new content model. Um, but there might even be some of those fields that are more like keywords or, or, or text-based fields that sort of act as like taxonomies. And maybe you need to create new taxonomy, new vocabularies for, for, those, uh, for those fields instead of just porting them into the, another text field. So this is the perfect time to add that, that structure to all that content. And this is a way that we keep track of it. This goes back to my, my love for spreadsheets. Um, this is one of our big ones. We call it a data transfer table. Uh, you'll see a ton of tabs along the bottom. Uh, we track the, the nodes, the, um, uh, the, all the content types and fields, um, all the, the blocks and views, and basically almost anything that can be tracked. It's just a big spreadsheet of basically anything that we uncover keeping track of all of the, again, the fields, where they're coming from on the old site, and where they're gonna to go to on the new site. Uh, you also probably have some type of transformations that has to happen when you're extracting data from the old site and pushing it into a new site. Uh, so this is a good spot to keep track of that as well, if you're having to actually extract some, some, some content from the markup of a, of a page, from the actual code of a page. Uh, this would be the, the right place to, to keep track of that. Even if it's simple, it's still worth keeping track of. Even a small site, you should still be creating documentation and keeping track of, of, of what's happening where. Because once you hand it over to developers or once the developers get involved, if they don't have clear direction, they'll probably make a, a good uh, a guess based on their intuition, their experience of previous pot projects. But it's not always going to be the right thing if you hadn't spent the time to plan it all out. So that's, again, where it makes sense to write all this stuff down clearly, document it all, and put that time into the, the discovery process. So now that you have those spreadsheets, and I said I don't like them, but they're really useful in the end, it's, it's decision time. Um, you need to decide for every content that you are going to, to migrate if it's going to be automated or manual. You want to go with an automated migration if you have large amounts of contents. For example, if you have 10 years worth of news article, you might want to, to go with an automated migration because nobody wants to pick the articles one by one and rewrite them on your new website. If your content is already structured with fields and everything, it should be quite easy to migrate it from your old website to your new website as well. And if you have a high frequency of changes on your website, if you want to be able to rerun your migrations right up until the end, an automated migration might be the right thing to do as well. On the other hand, if you want to do a content refresh, like remodeling your content types, a manual migration might be uh, the thing to consider. If you have small buckets of content as well, for example, for your landing pages or your, even your home page, you don't want to migrate those. You just recreate them on your new website and it's going to be way quicker. And in the end, if your content is highly unstructured, like for example, if all of your content is put into a gigantic with the wig editor, it might not be a good thing to consider an automated uh, migration and you want to go with manual, even if you have a lot of contents, because it's going to be really difficult for developers to migrate something that is not already structured into something that is. And it's time for the actual migration. Time to start the actual migration. Yeah. So you plan it all out at this point. Uh, you know what's going where and how. Um, so now we have to make that happen. Uh, this is going to look a little bit different depending on how your planning phase went. Um, and there's going to be probably a lot of work coming up. So let's assume that you have some help. Um, if by chance you don't, we know some people that can help. Uh, we're pretty good movers. But let's again assume that you, that you do. Um, so you're going to get your devs involved. 
Uh, they're going to do their ETLs, their ABCs, made some magic wands. But in the end, we are not magicians, at least I'm not. I just read the Drupal Book of Spells, which is really good, and I use it. But really, what we are doing here is not magic. We are building and rerunning the migrations over and over. We are pulling data from your actual website, try to twitch it with the, with the using the spreadsheet that we saw before, and put it into your new website until it fits. And we're going to do that over and over again. We typically do that in a way that we can do that over and over again, and with small changes, small iteration at every, some small changes at, uh, on every iteration so that we can go on, go on and go on until it fits. And we can find those little edge cases that no one thought about, and we can fix them along the way. So that's not your job. That's my job as a developer to do that. So what's, what's your job? What should you do and what should you expect? So let's cover what this process looks for you. So this is what a typical migration would look like, right? It's just you start the migration process, you developers make the scripts and, and do all that work. They test it out a little bit, uh, and then they just launch the new site. That, that, that sounds right. Well, I mean, maybe not, actually. Usually when we get to that testing phase, we'll uncover some, some, some new issues. Uh, the devs are going to probably uh, ask a bunch of questions, maybe even request some, some changes to happen on the, on, on the source site. Uh, and that's actually pretty expected. That's how this process goes. Um, so don't be surprised in that. They're probably going to un uncover maybe that module that was installed two years ago and never actually used. Uh, or maybe it's some random embedded widget in a WYSIWYG field. Uh, scripts and styles that are in, play in various places. Uh, each one of these is probably going to take some time to discuss, to figure out the right solution, to develop that solution, and then to, to move on from it. Um, but then, in reality, what we actually have is something more like this. Because once they've figured out all that work, they've uh, reran and tested migrations over and over again, maybe and, o and over and over and over again, um, then we'll come to the, the UAT phase, or the user acceptance testing. Uh, and that's really when uh, we get a chance to, to really get in and make sure that everything is looking good before that actual launch happens. So this is realistically uh, an overly simplified, but uh, you know, generally this is what that, that process does actually look like. So throughout this phase, um, this is what you are going to, to have to do. You need to plan your content freeze. At, at, at some point, um, freezes are, are needed. Your content needs to stop moving. You need to stop editing your content. You need to stop adding new content, new users. It takes a lot of coordination, a lot of planning and preparation, and you want to communicate with the dev team, with your content editors, so everybody is on the same page. There is a need of non-friction at this point. It's going to be very important that your content does not move so the migration can be as smooth as possible. And communication is going to be the key really here. Also, you need to fix issues at the source. As those tests are going to go, developers will constantly find new errors, new content that is not going to fit perfectly. And if you can fix those issues at the source instead of in your final website, it will be easier for us to rerun the migrations, as I was saying. If these issues are, maybe you, you might not be able to do that, but if you, if you are able to do that, fix those issues at the source. That's not always possible, but when possible, fixing it will make things easier in the end. It will allow devs to deal with the tougher problems, and it allows for easier reruns of migration. And generally, within this process, there's a lot of changes that are happening uh, in the new website. A lot of that's going to come down to uh, URL changes as well. Uh, and so the whole structure might actually change. You might have an entirely new URL structure. You could have a new domain name even. Um, and that's, not, that's actually an okay thing, as long as you've set up some redirects in place. Um, this can, if you don't have redirects, this can have a really big negative impact on the SEO of your site. And your newly migrated content might end up meaning that your traffic uh, uh, just tanks because nobody can find that, that old content anymore. Um, so this is when you can start to create a redirect mapping. And that means, yes, more spreadsheets. Um, it, it's, it's worth creating that, that full mapping of, of all of your URLs. But that said, 
um, your devs can actually also help here. We can make some wildcard redirects where we can take the entire structure of a, of a, or the structure of an entire set of URLs and redirect them in one simple rule. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to create a, a, every single page mapped to a new a URL. But it's important just to communicate this and work with the developers on it because they'll be able to help you in figuring out what can be done in that way. How can they you know, help you? How can they automate some of that process? Something else to consider though, when you're performing that content cleanup that we talked about earlier, you can't redirect to a, uh, to a, a page whose content doesn't match the original page, at least, at least closely. If you do, you might not end up with uh, any of that SEO benefit. Um, so it's, it's worth considering when you're deciding what you're gonna delete, uh, that redirecting process, um, how that's gonna look, and, and if you'll be able to, if you wanna keep that content, deleting it and then redirecting that old URL won't help. You'll need to be able to redirect it to, uh, to the same content on, on the new site. And as a, as a way to, to support us in all of this, we have some tools available. Uh, Google Search Console is one of them. Um, Bing also has a, a similar tool uh, if, if, that, that would be helpful as well. Um, it's important to consider it at this phase of the process because uh, some of this data can actually take a while to start to generate. Um, so you want to make sure at least a couple of weeks in advance, you just make sure that you have access to this, that it's collecting data, that, um, yeah, that, 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 it's, that it's ready to go. And we'll talk a little bit more about why in a, in a moment. We also sort of uh, hit on this a few times already, but your migration should probably, in most cases, be easy to repeat. Uh, and that does mean going back to the idea of fixing content at the source where you can. Um, the moving analogy kind of breaks down here because I definitely don't want to ever move again. Uh, but a migration, you do want to be able to redo over and over and over again on a website. Um, so your content will continue to evolve on that website, at least up until your content freeze date. So you have to be able to pick up those latest changes, pull those over, and make sure that those are all coming across. It does take some consideration though. Um, it makes it more difficult sometimes to update the content on the destination. Uh, if you rerun that migration, you do risk overwriting some of those changes that you made on the destination site. So it just, again, goes back to that fixing content at the source, but also just coordinating some of those updates. And we definitely recommend not leaving your trial runs of migrations uh, until later. Do them as soon as you can. Because no matter how confident you and the dev team might be that everything is under control, you're going to have hiccups. And it's, you might need, again, some of that time to discuss them, to develop the, the changes. Uh, so it's worth considering. Start it as soon as possible and get that underway and, and get those issues solved as soon as you can. There will come a time, too, when it's really time to dive in and do some of that really deep testing. So this is now your time to develop that test plan. Um, you're likely going to need to get some additional resources to help out with that, be it you know, more people to help or just getting uh, you know, the list of pages that you want to test in, uh, together, um, the steps to test certain functionalities. So definitely work with the dev team that you have. They'll be able to help you figure out what are some of the key templates that you need to worry about. Uh, you can also go back to some of that, the, the data as well that you have looking at Google Analytics data. That's going to help you develop the, and know what's the best places to test because it's now actually time to do the testing. Um, so let's say you're back in your pristine house now. Uh, you got everything that you were able to take with you. Now it's time that we actually figure out, does it all work? Uh, did it fit where we wanted it to? Um, and ultimately, just did you, did you miss anything? Did you leave anything on the truck? So we think of this as the, the UAT phase. So that's the user acceptance testing. And that goes back to you, know, you as a, a, a project manager or a website administrator or something, you are the one that knows this content best. Uh, so you're the one that's gonna be able to, again, figure out something's missing or not working. And that's why we really need uh, your involvement on, on this part. But in some of our cases, you know, 100,000 or 10,000 articles, uh, we might not be able to test all of that. So where do you even start? How do you test 10,000 different pages? It's probably not, not actually possible to do that. Um, so you can definitely think about spot checking. You can then again go back to that data and figure out where your most important content is. Um, but it's also worthwhile considering how you can run some automated testing. Um, 
Your dev team is going to be able to help you with that. We use a tool that we've developed called SiteDiff that, uh, that is actually free and open source uh, that you can use it to help with that. But that's, again, that's not your problem. That's what the developers will, will help out with. Uh, but it's just a matter of knowing that that's a, a possibility. You don't have to do this all manually because really when you're talking about 10,000 pages or more, there's no way you can, you can test those all manually. So we again go back to prioritizing testing using data. Um, I wonder if there's anybody in the room here that doesn't, that is managing a website that doesn't have an analytics package on their website, like Google Analytics or something else. I probably guess the answer is no. Um, so use that data to help find uh, what you need to test, what pages are important to test, uh, what are the most con uh, access to high traffic sites, or, or pages rather. So now you have to think about what exactly are we testing? There's a whole bunch of things that you're going to want to look at. Of course, one of them is just the content. Was it all migrated? Did it all make it over? Uh, did all, do all the linked images and files still work? Are the translations that you expected to be in place still there after the migration? Um, any other references like taxonomies or related content widgets, are, are those still connecting what they need to and, and, and finding those relationships? Any transformations that maybe the developers were working on, did they have the intended effect once the, the migration has ran? The layouts or visuals of those pages, is that things looking okay? Uh, the redirects that maybe you set up once the developers have implemented them, are they actually working as you expected? Any other links that need to work uh, that, that, sh that should be working? And this one's kind of important if you have development sites in, in, in use here too, that some of those uh, links are actually updated to go to the, the, uh, the, the new URL. And the metadata, don't forget about some of that SEO metadata as well, like uh, meta descriptions. Make sure all that got carried, carried along too. There's actually quite a bit here. There's, there's still even more that you can fit, that you'll need to, to worry about testing. This is a pretty good snapshot, I think, of, of where to start. And the last thing I'll say is also, uh, it's worth considering that perfect is the enemy of good. It's not always that you need to have everything being 100% perfect. Uh, so be willing to accept that something is good enough. Maybe that one, uh, those, those 10 year old news articles, you brought them across, but they don't need to be pixel perfect on the new site. Uh, if there's just a couple of little things off here and there, maybe that's okay. Maybe there's one or two articles that are high traffic and you really do want them to be pixel perfect, but the rest of them aren't quite, uh, aren't quite that important. And that's probably okay, because otherwise it might take you a long time to finish and fix all of this. So now we're on to moving day. Everything is packed and ready to go, uh, ready to hit the road. But what does moving day actually look like in the end? Really, at this point, with all the planning that we've done, the testing that we've done, everything else that had to happen, uh, it should be fairly straightforward and, and a non-event, really. Your launch should go fairly seamlessly and it should all happen nicely. But this is where your test plan comes in. And this is where it's important to actually execute on that plan, ensuring that all the testing was done, that everything's working well and as you would expect it to, to, to work. We also need to do some monitoring at this point. Um, this is where that search uh, console and some of those tools come into play. In the coming days and weeks and probably months and maybe even years, uh, check in on those tools and figure out if everything is looking okay. You can dive in and start to see uh, different errors, say if there's any errors with indexing certain content, or maybe a, a, a redirect loop where one of your redirects is not functioning. These are the tools that are going to help you find that. Uh, that maybe that you didn't identify in the rest of your testing. Um, so you can work with your dev team to, to really get into those and to get those solved quickly. And with any luck, if you were to submit your, your new sitemap early on, on launch day, um, you might see some of those error messages popping up sooner than later. We don't really know if that's going to actually influence anything if you resubmit it, but it's kind of a, seen as like a best practice. Uh, resubmitting it again might trigger Google to recrawl your site and, and surface any of those errors sooner than later. So congratulations, your migration's done. Everything went off without a hitch and everything is, uh, is good. So what did we learn along the road? First, <laughs> don't even move. If I ever move again, it's because the storm is going to take my house into another city, but I'm not doing that willingly. But when you have to move, and sometimes you have to take the time to prepare and to clean up ahead of time, that's very important. And did, did I say that? Don't underestimate the discovery phase. And hopefully you learned some other thing as well. Thank you very much. So we have some time for any questions, if anyone has any.
Yes. Yeah, a lot of our departments ask for their sites to be archived before the migration process. Do you guys offer archiving, or do you have an argument of why departments should do that? But I know that's uh, like an anxious moment for them when they're migrating. They feel like they're not going to catch everything, and then it's going to disappear in the ether. So archiving is in what it, oh, sorry, I'll repeat the question. Basically, if, if there's a, a, a process or a way or a need to archive, uh, a question before the migration, basically. Yeah, uh, archive like the whole, the entire the whole, site. the whole site. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and what does that really like? Is it so that it's still publicly accessible and they could access it? No, it's so that they personally can still access it, mm -hmm. just in case they miss something that they didn't realize was important two years down the line. Yeah, I mean, we would definitely have a ton of backups in place so that we can always do that. As a development team, we, we, we'd be able to access that. Um, in a lot of cases, if during the process we're also switching maybe to a new web host or something, it can sometimes be easy to access that old content. Uh, we've also had clients that have done that specifically. They've kept their old site up and running um, on their old infrastructure and everything where it's only accessible to them or maybe to their uh, IT teams. Um, I guess in terms of like if it's a best practice, I mean, I think, I think our, our go-to would just be to make sure that we have those backups available. Uh, and we'd hope that within the process, everything that led up to the migration, we've identified anything that's, that, was, um, that, was, you know, that, was, that was needed or that was missing. Um, so I don't think that we typically archive as a, as a default, uh, but I can see the value in it. And I think that it would certainly help to alleviate maybe some of the anxiety around the migration. Uh, so maybe there are, is definitely a, a, a case to be made to do that. If you have any no, uh, thoughts on that, yeah. Does that does that kind of answer the, your your question? Uh, yeah, we we've noticed that sometimes it's hard to like create a navigatable or clickable site for for them all, like immediately off of of Drupal. So we try to think of ways to make it like linked PDFs, just so it's like off of our our servers or off of our Pantheon, but they still navigate it. But that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, Pantheon would be interesting because you can always create a, a, a duplicated environment. Uh, yeah. So that's always nice too. If you wanted to do that for like a month or something, and set yourself a reminder for after a month to uh, go and clean it up afterwards. Because um, yeah, it, it it definitely consumes a certain amount of, of something of resources of time of maintenance of everything to to keep it up and running available there, even if it's hidden. Um, so it's. Uh, yeah, and I think that would be worth considering too, is how long should it remain available if, if somebody did, did, did want that. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, it's a, good, uh, a good, good question, a good thing to, to think through as you're going through the process, and probably something that we'd hope to discuss and uncover if there was that anxiety earlier in the discovery phase and, and figure out the, the right way to, to handle it, whether it is an archived site or if it's just through some additional testing or, or ways to, to reassure everybody that everything's going to get moved over correctly. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, you mentioned that during the process, this the migration from the to test it. Uh, what will happen if we need to migrate the API? And let's say in the source, we have so many files. To make a gigabyte, for example, if we keep running like this, this means that we keep downloading from the Gigabyte file over and over. Is there any tip to, to accelerate the process and avoid downloading so many times? Yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of dealing with the raw files, uh, depending on how the process was set up, um, you could use uh, tools that would do that in more of an incremental or, or to sort of like a differential way. Um, to uh, think of off the top of my head if dealing with files would be uh, rsync, a command line tool. And that can just transfer the changes, whether it be new files or um, just changes in, in files detecting that. Um, but that might not fit into the overall process in terms of how everything else is being migrated. Uh, so you have to figure out you know, how that's working with within the database as well. Some of those files have to be you know, linked into their entities. And so um, there needs to be some consideration there too. Um, but I think I would, I would uh, look for something like that as a way to handle the actual changes in, in file sizes and then maybe have the, the migration happening on a, um, in a, d a database level to make sure that that's also being done in an incremental way. Does that help? Thanks. 
Okay, great. Well, um, we did want to also, uh, before we go, just mention, you may have heard about our upcoming uh, Evolve Drupal event uh, coming up in Atlanta on uh, April uh, 12th. Um, so it's coming up real soon, just under a month now. Uh, it's kind of a similar uh, vibe, similar uh, uh, Drupal camp style event. We'll have a few different tracks of, of accessibility sessions and uh, design sessions and, and content sessions and a whole bunch of different things, um, as well as some additional uh, in-person training sort of around that event too, uh, including uh, site building and module development and, and SDCs and a whole bunch of great stuff. So uh, definitely uh, check that out. Uh, we have the EvolveDrupal.com website if you're interested, uh, going to be in the area, or just want to uh, to learn more. Flights are cheap. So. <laughs> Flights are cheap, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you again. <laughs>